All right, I see it is one o'clock. Um, so let's get started. Um, welcome everybody um, to our final session for our 2020 virtual annual meeting. Um, I'm really delighted that you are joining us for these these panels. Um, it's going to be a little different. We'll have some live panels and then this afternoon we'll have some recorded panels. Um, but I, uh, before I turn it over to the program committee, one thing I just want to ask everybody is that at the end of the um, conference today, I'll be sending out a survey um, to through the LAMPS listserv. And if you would please, please, please um, fill out that survey. Those surveys really help our program committee and governance figure out what to do for the upcoming year. So expect to see that survey um, at the end of our conference and um, and um, as before, just make sure that you are muted unless you're speaking. Make sure you use the chat um, or raise your hand. We'll have people monitoring. And of course, you're welcome to unmute. We'll make sure there's opportunities to do so. But other than that, I'm going to turn it over to John Reese. I'll stop the share. All right. Welcome back, everybody. It's so good to see you again. Um, I just want to say how impressed I was yesterday with all the presenters. I gave up presentation this morning at work and it was really hard to do without seeing people's faces and being in the same room. So kudos to y'all for that. Um, today we're continuing our access and outreach part two uh, theme, starting off with Mallory Warner and Rachel Anderson with their talk, Flipping the Switch, Making All Museum Catalog Records at the National Museum of American History. Take it away. All right, thank you. Um, just a moment here, I'm gonna share my screen. And then I'm going to get this started. Can everyone see that okay? I see nodding, so I'll continue. <laughs> um, well, uh, thank you all for your interest in this topic. Um, my name is Mallory Warner and my colleague presenting with me is Rachel Anderson. Um, we're the collections, we're collections staff based in the Curatorial Division of Medicine and Science at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Um, where we help care for the museum's collection of more than 60,000 objects relating to medical history. 2020 marks the first year that the museum made nearly all of its previously internal collections data records publicly available through the museum and the Central Smithsonian website. Um, prior to this, the museum had been selective about which records went online. Um, digitizing object records was done usually through dedicated projects, um, often based on subject matter. So for instance, uh, the antibody initiative and exhibit websites like um, for shows like modern medicine and the great war um, Our previous workflow for digitization required a lot of investment in getting records what we called web ready um, So here's a nice web ready record um, Getting it web ready included reviewing legal title writing web labels for individual objects Sometimes it meant requesting new photography and then several layers of course of review and approval so the process resulted in very informative and beautiful records, um, but for a museum with 1.7 million objects, it wasn't an efficient way to make the entirety of the collection publicly accessible. So in about 2018, the museum decided to work towards flipping the switch, um, making all museum records, no matter how complete or incomplete they might be, available online at one time. Um, obviously, we are not the first museum to do this, but especially at a large institution such as ours, um, there's always some trepidation with cultural change. So we were moving away from a philosophy of risk aversion towards the philosophy of risk tolerance and transparency. Um, and so once the curatorial staff heard about this new policy, we naturally had a few concerns. Um, how would we communicate that the records um, are works in progress? Would we experience an influx of public inquiries regarding these records? And then how would we make sure that personally identifiable information, PII, is kept off the web? I think my colleague Rachel is going to take it from here. So um, happily, um, I can say that this has been a great experience uh, so far. And I think we've been able to adequately address all of those concerns that Mallory enumerated. Uh, the Smithsonian has been around since 1846, and the levels of detail in record keeping have really ebbed and flowed curator by curator over time. 
So for instance, here we have a particularly useless record um, now available online for your viewing pleasure. You can see that there is absolutely minimal usable information there. Um, and when it comes to communicating that records like these are works in progress, we were able to follow the lead of other institutions like the British Museum. We created a public statement acknowledging that these records are living things constantly being fleshed out. Now, admittedly, the statement is a bit buried on the website, and initially we had hoped that it would be a pop-up on each record, but this has yet to materialize. The statement has not calmed all fears. Some staff members remain worried that many incomplete records damage the institution's reputation. However, the statement does provide us with useful language to help explain why we have chosen this level of transparency. Our second concern, that more online records would lead to a flood of public inquiries, has so far not been borne out. Anecdotally, public inquiries via email for the Medicine, Division of Medicine and Science seem to have remained about the same, actually. And if we take a look at the Google Analytics data for access to medicine collections records, you can see that the numbers have stayed pretty steady. We flipped the switch on December 10, 2019, where the blue arrow is pointing and have maintained a fairly even access level until our COVID bump this March. So personally identifiable information. Um, beyond the usual PII concerns, medical collections of course are a treasure trove of PII pitfalls. They contain a different variety of personal information and we knew we needed a proactive strategy to ferret out the problems. Our digital programs office took the lead in defining which PII records were held back or redacted. They followed the guidance laid out by the National Archives and by previous Smithsonian directives. Um, but our, and our database team did targeted searches for PII key terms, as well as number chains that match social security number formats. But uh, the museum also went beyond PII and broadened the net, particularly with images. We reviewed records for sources that may have had no voice in the decision to donate, for instance, records containing information about sexual orientation or gender identity of someone who may not be publicly out, information collected about a person while they were incarcerated, private or sensitive information about a still living person collected when they were a minor, especially images of children, prescription information, and information and images exposing individuals within medical or pharmaceutical studies. Now, in most cases, this did not mean keeping records uh, with a sort of information off of the web completely. Instead, we withheld certain images and we redacted our transcriptions of sensitive information found on the object. So a great case study uh, that we looked at for these particular PII considerations was this narcotic prescription book from 1919. We worried that public access to images of the object might be problematic. The digitized book makes public, for example, the full name of a resident of the county jail to whom morphine was dispensed. We decided that the value of the historical document, the public nature of court records, plus the age of the book, superseded concerns about medical or personal privacy. A note in the image record now specifies PII, medical outside of 75 year limit, no restrictions. Now that all records go straight to the web, it has made us more thoughtful in our cataloging. In the most extreme circumstances, we have to consider if certain protected information needs to be recorded in the object record at all. But more generally, we must be mindful about confining sensitive information to those data fields that do not map to the public view of our object records. We had to change a very basic assumption about our own collections database. Once considered to be an internal professional tool, we now think of our database as more public facing. So finally, I'd like to touch on how you can access these records if you're interested. Um, there are two main ways you can access the records. The first you see here is the Smithsonian Collection Search Center, um, and it's useful for broad access to objects from across the Smithsonian. Not all of our units have completely digitized their records, but um, you can get a multidisciplinary look at a subject on, a page, on this page. Um, the other way is to access records um, if you're specifically interested in things held by the American History Museum is just to use our website. Um, and I find that interface actually a lot more pleasing. 
So I hope that this little taste of the records will encourage you to use this resource with an understanding of its shortcomings. Um, we'd love to hear from you um, with any suggestions for improving or editing records. So please do reach out with any thoughts or research inquiries. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Mallory. Thank you. I forgot to mention that we'll be doing Q&A after our next presentation. So hold your questions for then. Next up, we have Don Lucas and Elizabeth Ott talking about offensive and dehumanizing ethical considerations for exhibiting historical beliefs and attitudes about race. Take it away. All right. Um, I am trying, there we go. Okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Dawn Howard Lucas, Technical Services Archivist at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I'm presenting today with my colleague, Elizabeth Ott, who is the Frank Borden Haynes Curator of Rare Books at UNC. And we're here today to talk about our recent exhibit, Race and Construction, Science and the Making a Difference at the Wilson Special Collections Library. Due to the sensitive subject matter, planning this exhibit involved a lot more time and consideration than usual. We'd like to briefly describe our process for what we think has been a successful exhibit, although it's been interrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I'm going to turn things over to Liz Ott now. So part of the purpose of this exhibit was that we had an occasion that we wanted to showcase our health sciences collections at UNC libraries. UNC has a strong tradition of uh, holdings in the history of medicine, but we're not known for highlighting those collections. And part of the reason for that is that our collections used to be split. Uh, between the rare book collection, which is located in Wilson Special Collections Library, and the Health Sciences History Collection, which was located in our Health Sciences Library. But in 2018, the Special Collections Program at the Health Sciences Library was moved to combine with the Wilson Special Collections Library, and this merger gave us the opportunity to consider new research areas that previously had been difficult to do because the collections were physically divided on campus. So we wanted to do an exhibit that would broadly explore the concept of race through the lens of medicine and science because we wanted to illustrate how these collections brought together could be used to illuminate topics that are still relevant today. So as two white women born, raised, and presently living in the American South and who work for a university with a long history of institutional racism, we wanted to make sure not only that the information we planned to display in the exhibit was scientifically and historically accurate, but that it was as culturally sensitive as possible. Although we had strong support from administration to do this exhibit, there were doubts among some of our colleagues that we could pull this off without causing a huge controversy. So we therefore assembled a four member advisory panel to review our selections and labels. We invited Dr. Claude Clegg, Dr. Rana Hogarth, Dr. Raul Nekachea, and Dr. Ar Arwin Smallwood to be on this panel because we thought they could provide both subject expertise and a non-white perspective to our work. In order to give them time to review and give feedback, we selected items and wrote labels much farther in advance than we usually would. Rana Hogarth, the author of the book Medicalizing Blackness, Making Racial Difference in the Atlantic World, was also the lecturer for our exhibit opening event. Um, and with the exception of Dr. Hogarth, who received an honorarium for her lecture, the advisory panel members volunteered their expertise in labor. Although we didn't pay them, we did try to thank them by involving them in opening event activities, by inviting them to lunch and dinner with select library donors and staff members. So our first step in any exhibit design is to create the themes and topics that will um, provide the narrative for the subject we're exploring. And in this case, we ended up with these 11 themes that you see on the screen. Um, as with all of our exhibits, the themes emerge from the objects in our collection, which is to say that this particular approach to the topic of the history of race is really informed by, and in many ways limited by, the biases that are present in UNC libraries collecting history. In Wilson, we have a strong tradition of displaying original objects, so we don't do a lot of facsimiles. And we also typically have never done a lot of loans from other institutions. 
So that really means that when we design an exhibit, we are primarily looking at our own collections and what is displayable within the physical constraints of our exhibit room. In certain cases, this was limiting to what we could um, explore in our narrative. For example, we had really hoped that we would be able to highlight more voices of scientists, medical professionals, and intellectuals who were not white. But because our collections have a clear bias for white authors, we were sometimes hampered in trying to do this. And an example of this is in the comparative anthropology case. Our advisory panel pointed out that we had this lacuna um, that we weren't including black authors such as W.E.B. DuBose and James McCune Smith who had written extensively on race and anthropology. And um, when we went back to try to see if we could rectify this missing gap, we didn't really have anything in the collection that reflected their contributions to the history of medicine and science. So we ended up compromising by incorporating a quotation from DuBose's writings really prominently in our graphic display. Um, Selection was tricky in another way in that we had to consider how to educate our audience on painful and sometimes shocking beliefs. Beliefs made more demeaning for being couched in terms of objective science. Um, typically in an exhibition, you want to choose visually appealing objects that can add interest and variety to displays of books. You don't just want a wall of text. But in this exhibit, we didn't want to use this approach because we didn't want to treat demeaning, violent, or dehumanizing images as decoration. Our biggest concern was to always strike a balance between accurately depicting this very difficult topic and not underplaying how widespread and powerful racist ideas were and are without gratuitously lingering on painful or alarming images, words, or content. Um, so this, what you see on the screen are some examples of ways that we did that. Uh, in particular cases. The other way that we tried to do this was we did use a content warning. Um, it was incorporated into the introductory panel that um, was at both sides of the gallery because you can enter the gallery at either end. Um, we uh, thought that people would appreciate having the um, the ability to decide for themselves if they wanted to be exposed to this topic. We expected students, faculty, and visitors to be affected by the topic, and we knew we had a responsibility to engage with them thoughtfully and sensitively. Um, we were planning this exhibit right around the same time that Harvard was dealing with a lawsuit by uh, Tamara Lanier um, for using photographs of, of uh, Lanier's ancestors who were enslaved in uh, exhibits about the history of science and race. So it was very much on our mind that we wanted to avoid um, kind of exploitative use of images. Um, also uh, in this, we used a graphic design that avoided the use of images. Instead, we used a textured paper background and focused on a kind of abstracted graphic design. The only visual kind of um, uh, glyph was a caliper graphic that sort of alluded to um, the use of calipers in phrenology, but we we stepped back from using any images of actual objects in any of the promotion or graphics for the exhibit. Don, over to you. Yes. Uh, all right. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, we had a good amount of publicity for the opening event. Rana Hogarth and I were interviewed for the WUNC radio show, The State of Things, about her book and the exhibit. And there was a lot of excitement around Dr. Hogarth's visit, including a group of students from our School of Medicine's chapter of the National Medical Association who requested to meet with her. Um, Liz and I were both interviewed for the UNC online publication, The Well, and I was interviewed for UNC student newspaper, The Daily Tar Heel. Um, all of this publicity was good publicity, and the opening event was well attended. An exhibit catalog will come out at some point later this year, although due to current circumstances, we're not exactly sure when. So some uh, reflections on uh, what worked and what didn't. Um, one of the things that was definitely true is that because we planned so far in advance, um, we really did that so that we could give the advisory panel time to tell us things like, your whole approach is wrong, not just like don't use this item or rephrase this, but really engage with the whole narrative. 
And um, as a result, when we were installing, it had been several months since we had actually seen some of the content and we were confronted again by how offensive some of it was. Um, one particularly offensive item that we considered at the last minute pulling was a broadside that was printed in Hillsborough, North Carolina during the civil rights era that um, it's a double-sided broadside and on one side it depicts a, um, an ape and that has all of this kind of pseudoscientific classification language around it, um, demonstrating the different aspects of the ape. The other side of the broadside is an African-American, um, a, a caricature of an African-American male made to look like an ape with the same classification language grouped around it, um, implying that or explicitly stating that African-Americans and apes are, are closely related. And um, it's, it's just such an ugly and disgusting image that we thought, should we really be putting this on display? And um, it was at that point in that, in that moment of installation that we were really glad that we had had this advisory board who had weighed in on everything because um, they had given us this extra layer of stepping outside of our perspective and um, with their expertise and their, their long study of this topic, um, we were able to say like, no, it's important for us to draw attention to the fact that um, the language of classification and the debates about um, uh, you know, monogenesis versus polygenesis were still active even into the 1960s and affecting civil rights. Um, the other thing that we, I, I would say was a, a great success in terms of the advisory panel is that because we had these uh, folks on campus who were really um, invested in the topic because they had spent time reviewing our labels, talking about the topic with us. Um, they made for great partners when we had our opening lecture. So they did a lot of work to bring in students, to provide publicity, and we ended up having a really um, fantastic opening event. It was pouring down rain the day of the lecture and we still had a great turnout, which um, is somewhat unusual as you can imagine. Um, the feedback on the exhibit overall has been positive, although um, our caveat is that it wasn't up for very long before the library had to close because of COVID-19. Um, but uh, Dawn had mentioned that in the beginning we had some colleagues who were skeptical that we could do a version of this exhibit that wouldn't be so controversial that it would make it not worthwhile to do. And those same colleagues gave us very positive feedback once the exhibit was actually installed. So we felt like we had converted some folks who were skeptical that we could pull it off. We did pull it off. <laughs> um, so the exhibit was deinstalled before campus shut down, but we do plan to reinstall it for about a month once the campus opens back up um, because we'll need some time before our next exhibit can be prepared and installed. So we're really looking forward to being able to do that to gather a little bit more data about um, how students, faculty, and visitors are going to react to what we were able to put together. All right, um, that is all we have for right now. So please feel free to contact us with questions. Um, I think I somehow accidentally managed to stop sharing the slides at some point for those <laughs> of you keeping along with your Zoom bingo at home. Um, so um, if you need me to go back to any slides during the Q&A, um, maybe I can do that. Great, thanks Dawn and Liz, that was a great presentation. We've got a few minutes for um, Q&A. So, yeah, that, I was just gonna, John, I'm happy to help with chat or if you wanna take the lead, go, go for it. Yeah, me too. Sure, great. I saw one comment earlier from Polina about asking to um, share the sensitivity statement. I saw it flash by on the screen, but maybe you could connect offline and show yeah, you. Yeah, I can also um, put it back up. Um, let's see. You know, while Don is doing that, I'll just say we had a lot of debate about um, that we really explicitly wanted it to be a content warning rather than a trigger warning. Um, that uh, we, we went back and forth about it, but we, we really decided that what we wanted to do was to um, 
give people kind of informed consent about what the exhibit was about, but also let people know why we felt it was important to cover this topic in an exhibit, sort of what our agenda was and be transparent about it. And can you see it up on the screen now? Yes. Okay. Great. I think the next question is, do you think the Silent Sam situation had any effect on how your exhibit was supported or received, either by administration or by the public? <laughs> um, Liz, do you want to take that one? <laughs> Sure. Um, so I will say that in the context of Wilson Library um, has always had a, um, a kind of skin in the game with the Silent Sam protests and uh, controversies. And a large part of that is because we also hold the university archives. So a lot of the research on, of people on both sides of the debate has taken place in Wilson Library. And like many um, special collections libraries, to many who wanted to find a compromise, Wilson Library seemed like an ideal location to relocate the statue to kind of, I don't know, depoliticize it by putting it in, in, a, in a repository instead of co continuing to have it as a monument. Um, and thankfully that did not happen. Um, but um, I will say that in terms of our history of science and medicine collections, I do think that um, one of the reasons that I was really excited to tackle this topic is that I think that a lot of people didn't really see those collections as contributing in any way to contemporary debates about the history of race and, um, and the politics of race. Um, we had a case in the exhibit that was called, um, and I'm going to get it wrong. Dawn, can you go back to the themes? If you're still sharing your screen. <laughs> um, that was called America and the Making of Race, where we sort of explicitly made a case that, um, that, that the science of race had influenced things like slavery, immigration policies, and, um, and cultural perceptions of race. So, um, I, I don't know that anyone ever brought it up as an explicit link, but it was definitely there in my mind that one of the reasons that we wanted to talk to talk about this topic and to do this exhibit was to um, show how all the collections in Wilson Library can contribute to our understanding of of race and race relations, not just ones that are are about um, North Carolina and civil rights or the specific or the Civil War, you know. All right, I think our next question is for Mallory and Rachel. They want you to say more about the decision to consider information about gender and sexuality private, such as for living people or for all. And they know that a number of institutions that focus on collecting history of gender and sexuality minorities have taken the stance that you never out a living person without their consent because it's a personal choice and can be a safety issue, but it's not private information after people's death. And the, their second question is, what constitutes information about sexuality? Does being married count, for example? Sorry, does what count, for example? Um, being married. Oh, being married. Um, I think uh, my colleague, Rachel, actually might know a little bit more about this than I do. I'll let her jump in. And I will say, um, a lot of that consultation was done with um, Catherine Ott, who um, does a lot more work with our um, gender and sexuality collection than we do. Um, but that was one, um, that was one um, of the topics that we considered when we were reviewing records. Um, Rachel, do you have anything you want to add? I wasn't involved in that sure. specifically. Yeah, and just like Mallory said, really this was done on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, everyone worked really closely with uh, Catherine Ott, as Mallory mentioned, because in, in most cases, I would say, Catherine had actually been personally involved with um, with the folks doing the donation. And so she was able to have that conversation. She knew a lot about the background, the intentions um, of those individuals on a case by case basis and could advise regarding any, any sort of um, very particular personal concerns that an individual might have. 
And if need be, she could even check in with those folks a lot of the time. And you know, this would come up in, in some of the more obvious ways you would think of in regard to um, donations that people had made where the donation is so specifically about queer history that you really have no concern about most of it. The intent is, of the donor is clear. In other cases though, for example, um, we had a Rolodex donated by uh, some queer activists that contained the names of hundreds of individuals. And so the question came up, um, what will we do in regard to photographing the cards in that Rolodex? It was a really interesting conundrum. So um, all this to say that we don't, to my knowledge, um, in the division have anything that lays out a specific policy. Rather, it's been case by case, sort of keeping an eye out for those particular sessions we know could have um, these issues attached to them. And I'll just add that our um, deed of gift language does make it pretty explicit that um, donated objects can be used for any range of typical museum purposes. Um, but I think we've really been, um, we have been, um, it's been suggested that we really, um, you know, in, increase the um, conversation with our donors because sometimes people, you know, I mean, obviously people donating 20 years ago maybe would not have envisioned things um, being up and accessible on the web, but, it, you know, just to be explicit in our conversations with donors and even to get that sort of um, explicit language um, in written communication with them that they understand that part of what this might be um, means fully digitizing these objects at some point. Um, and we tried to stay conservative um, when that intention was not always clearly communicated. Great. Um, next question is, did you have any collection items that included insensitive images aside from upsetting texts? And if so, did they get special consideration? Is that for me and Liz? I believe so. Okay. Um, so there, there were, um, and Liz can chime, feel free to chime in on this too. Um, we we tried to have a balance between um, you know getting the point across and um, you know and just being gratuitous. So we tried to be careful. Um, there is some upsetting imagery, but then sometimes we might have said, um, I guess one example is um, we included the adventures of Huckleberry Finn, um, and we decided um, you know the if it's the um, edition with the green cover, with the illustration of uh, Huck Finn on it. And we decided that that was um, enough illustration to get the point across. Um, not that we didn't necessarily need to turn to a page where there was a picture of Jim with offensive language in it. Um, so we, we tried to strike a balance where possible. And I don't, Liz, I don't know if you wanna um, add anything to that. Yeah, I will say the broadside that I described that uh, was two-sided um, with the image of the ape and the caricature of an African-American on the other side is probably the most offensive visual item that we had in there. And because it was double-sided, you know, we, we didn't put up the image that was the ape. We put up the ape side and that was sort of like a choice of like, um, we don't, uh, even though the viewer can kind of intuit what's going to be on the other side and we described it, we didn't want to put up the caricature side. Um, overall, I would say we largely avoided, like we did not have any images that, um, any photographs, we didn't have photographs of, of actual people's bodies. We didn't have um, images that show, like we, we tried to steer clear of images that were heavily caricatured or, um, or particularly offensive, I, I guess. Um, although there's lots of language that's on display and I guess we sort of decided that, uh, um, you know, images are so much more, um, it's so much harder to stop yourself from looking at an image. Sometimes you just see something and you can't unsee it. So um, we very much deselected uh, shocking images, but there's lots of language and just the attitudes and beliefs are very dehumanizing. So that's kind of why the content warning was there was to kind of explicitly say the opinions and the 
the language that you'll sometimes see is is going to be dehumanizing um, and it is offensive we kind of wanted to just say that right out like we recognize and acknowledge that it is um the way that it's that it comes across and the way that it is um but here's why we've put it on display but yeah we really shied away from um from visual images um and uh there i mean there definitely were some things there there was a postcard um and don could maybe talk i think don is the one who found it that um depicts an african-american woman giving birth is that right am i giving this right don um i don't think it's her giving birth but it is um but uh, something along those lines um this, I, I think you're talking about a postcard that one of our colleagues found in a collection yes. uh, that was kind of like not really relevant to the collection at all yeah, but it, uh, like sort of around the same time, one of our advisory panel members was sort of uh, bringing our attention to th this image had been used in um, in this kind of gift book about the history of the medical uh, school at UNC that they were giving out to first year residents. And then finally, someone was sort of like, why is this very disturbing image just decorating this book that's given out so we I, I think it was very much in our mind to um to not show a lot of images yeah yeah and actually yeah that, that that's a different sorry for my confusion it's a different thing from the postcard but same idea <laughs> i guess it's just like this uh exploitation um uh of black bodies um you know in books on postcards why is it there The next question is for the Smithsonian. How many object records that had PII that need a review? Can you speak more to workflow on how you reviewed those? Sure, um, this is Mallory. I can say that um, we would not have been able to do this without our wonderful digital programs team that we have at the museum. Um, they do a lot of work on our database and our digital assets management system. And um, they were really the ones who guided this process. Um, and when they um, made their workflow for the review of the PII, um, they did a lot of tar targeted searches, but they really followed the lead of other institutions. I mean, obviously, <laughs> we are late to the game here. So um, the, the institution I think they found the most useful for this in guidance was really the National Archives. And I think we strongly followed their lead. So one of the best things personally that I think they did with this program um, uh, the digital programs office did for us is they basically made like a nice little um, workflow cheat sheet um, guide for us and I think they would probably be happy to share that. Um, I will share my email address in the chat window and if people want to reach out to me um, I can ask our digital programs team if they're okay with that. Here. Um, but basically it kind of lets you um, make a decision. It's like a decision tree on whether or not you should share something. And the NARA, uh, the National Archives guidance basically says that they do not share medical diagnosis or condition, religion, sexual orientation, citizenship status, or criminal history information if it is younger than 75 years old. So um, that was what guided our, our thought process there mostly. And just to... <laughs> To add to that, um, you know, this was doing the medical collections records. This was part and parcel of, of our digital office, looking at all of the records for American history. And so our records fell into their, their general sweep through there and their general hit list for how they were looking for any sort of PII. But then they were really great in that, um, they basically consulted with us, consulted with particular curators um, who they knew might have special considerations um, from a medical point of view, um, from a queer history point of view, where they could direct that staff to look into those accessions and see if there is anything else that we should be aware of, things that would have fallen outside of the general policies for PII. Great. Our next question is for Dawn and Elizabeth. Will your exhibit exist online or in some shareable form? Um, we are going to have the exhibit catalog that will be coming out. Um, I 
at this time, I don't think there are any plans um, for there to be an online version, but Liz, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, we plan for a, a print um, catalog and kind of the reason behind that has to do with the fact that this exhibit came out as part of the um, moving of the collections and we wanted to have something physical to kind of attest to that. Um, but uh, we may see it move online, especially since the coronavirus. Um, we've, we've traditionally not done a lot of online exhibits at Wilson Library, and that's something that now we're sort of um, <laughs> frustrated with ourselves for not doing. So I wouldn't be surprised if we ended up um, migrating some of the content that we've already prepared for the print catalog into an online version of the exhibit, but it's TBD. And then next question is, how did you select advisory panel? Um, so we were really looking for people um, who we thought would have um, both the subject expertise in the history of the health sciences and just um, you know, in the history of um, African Americans, um, particularly in the South. Um, although perhaps not exclusively. So Rana Hogarth was the um, kind of an obvious example for her expertise um, due to her book. Um, I had approached her actually at AHM in Columbus last year and asked if she would be interested. We, I don't think we had like an idea for an advisory panel at that time per se, but just if um, she would be interested in helping us in reviewing our content. Um, and then, um, Arwen Smallwood is at um, North Carolina A&T University in Greensboro, um, and he has a lot of expertise in um, African American history in North Carolina. Um, Raul Nekachea is in the Department of Social Medicine um, at UNC. He is uh, really UNC's um, history of health sciences person um, um, with, with the PhD in the history of medicine. Um, and then Claude Clegg is also um, an expert in African American history on our campus. Um, so we just want that. That's um, really, um, they all had qualifications, we thought, to review the work and give a lot of feedback and let us know, um, in particular, if we were doing anything that was just really, um, you know, off course and steer away from. All right, next question is for the Smithsonian team. Um, 75 years was mentioned as a cutoff date for providing access. How did you decide on that time period? I think that we just answered that question previously. Is that right? About 75 years? Yeah, I think we kind of combined two, two answers into one there. Oh, um, like Mallory perfect. mentioned, really, we followed the, the National Archives guidelines for that. Great. Um, the next question is going down the line. For Don Elizabeth, why didn't you plan to have this exhibit on view for a longer period of time? Um, I'll, I'll let Liz uh, explain the whole calendar system for exhibits. <laughs> So typically exhibits, um, we do three per year. So basically like one in the fall semester, one in the spring semester, one in the summer. Um, and uh, originally it was going to be up for a longer amount of time. Um, but uh, every other year we host a student curated exhibit that is up over the summer, but is planned in the preceding spring semester. And because students are involved in putting that exhibit together, it gets installed a little bit earlier than um, is normally the case. And uh, then another factor was that um, the exhibit that preceded Race Deconstructed was an exhibit called On the Move, which was curated by our colleague in the Southern Historical Collection, Shetra Powell. And um, because of some events that were happening on campus, that um, overlapped with the theme of her exhibit on the move was about um, 
African-American migration in the United States, it was, we decided to extend that exhibit so that it could be up during these events on campus where people would be thinking about this topic and visiting the exhibit gallery. So, um, and then coronavirus is the, the other answer. So um, we had uh, just installed it a couple, a few weeks past and then the library shut down. So we deinstalled um, for security reasons, basically, because no one was going to be in the building. Um, but um, we will be reinstalling it and it will be up for at least another month, but I kind of suspect a little bit longer because of um, the interruptions caused by coronavirus. No one has been able to do exhibition prep for the exhibits that we plan to come after Race Deconstructed. So there's going to be a lag time um, once we get back in the building where we're trying to get back on track in terms of planning the next exhibit and then um, installing it. So it will go back up and, um, and I, I think we're both looking forward to that because um, it, it really was like about a two or three year period of time that Don and I were scheming and planning and plotting and uh, putting this exhibit together. And then um, it was really unfortunate that it was such a brief window of time that it was actually on display to the public. Well, thanks everyone. We're kind of at